I'm Betsy Peck, Learned Dean of University Libraries, and thank you all so much for coming. This is a great turnout. The John Howard Burst Jr. Memorial Program includes this evening's keynote lecture, the exhibition currently mounted in the library's exhibition cases, which was curated by Professor Christine Fagan, right here, <laughs> with help from Heidi Benedict, our archivist, and several other staff members in the library. It was really a team effort. Um, it also includes um, a satellite exhibit at the Rogers Free Library in Bristol, um, reading group discussions that took place there, and for the first time this year, a found poetry writing workshop, and Susan Tassant led those discussions and the poetry workshop. Susan, can you raise your hand and stand up a little? There she is. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> She's right there. <laughs> The Burst Program celebrates a milestone anniversary of the publication of an important work of literature. This year's selection, The Red Badge of Courage by Stephen Crane, is celebrating its 125th year and was selected by the Burst Committee, a group of Roger Williams faculty, staff, and students, our Burst Program donor, Jennifer Murphy, over here, <laughs> um, and a representative from Rogers Free Library in Bristol, Susan Tesson, who I introduced. Um, this committee is chaired by Professor Adam Braver, a Roger Williams University professor of creative writing and also our library program director. You will meet him in a minute. Um, and thank you very much to the Burst Committee. I know that Meg Case is here from that committee and um, we, we had a couple meetings but um, it was a very easy selection this year and, and um, certainly a consensus by all on the committee. Um, let's see. Tonight, we welcome Christopher Benfee, Mellon Professor of English at Mount Holyoke College, um, whom Professor Braver will introduce in a moment. We are hugely grateful to Robert Blaze, an alumnus of Roger Williams University in 1970. Bob, can you stand up so everybody can see you? Okay, raise your hand. <laughs> Who, with his gift to the university in the year 2000, <clears throat> made these events possible. Unfortunately, oh, I won't say, unfortunately, Mr. Blaze can't be here tonight because he's here. <laughs> We're thrilled that Mr. Blaze is here tonight and honored that his daughter Jennifer has been helping us um, with both the birth selection and attending all of our events. Mr. Blaze's gift to the university was in honor of his mentor and friend, Professor John Howard Burst, Jr. Professor Burst was a scholar of Herman Melville and Walt Whitman and a collector of first editions. This year's selection, The Red Badge of Courage, held a special place in the heart of Professor Burse. Bob Blaze maintains a collection of Professor Burse's research on the novel, um, and we believe it's a fitting, a fitting selection this year to celebrate 20 years of Burse programming here at Roger Williams with this selection, The Red Badge of Courage. The Blaze gift supports an exhibition, a library book fund for collecting works related to the exhibit, and a keynote lecture. In partnership with funding from the Honors Program, the donation also allows for a library-led archival visit with two students, or we call them Burst Fellows. This year, Jillian Damiani and Emma Phipps. Are you here, Jillian and Emma? Oh, there they are. Thank you. Who visited the Stephen Crane Archive at Columbia University to select items for the exhibition. We believe this is a really great opportunity um, of experiential learning for our students. And if Oh, they are here, so I already said that, sorry. For those of you who have not yet seen the exhibition, please visit the exhibit cases behind the library and media tech desks out front. Um, it will be up until the end of March. I'd also like to point out that library staff have prepared a research guide on the book and a virtual exhibit with images of artifacts from the exhibition available on the library's website uh, on the Burst uh, web, web page. And um, there's a link from the library homepage to the Burst page, or you can simply Google Roger Williams Burst, and it will come up. And now I'd like to invite Adam to introduce Professor Benfi. Thank you. All right. Thank you all for attending. Um, it's really a privilege to have this this lecture annually, this talk um, annually. Um, in part um, because I, um, it, I think it's very important that we pause and consider works of art, works of literature that have transcended the, the moment and in a way uh, perhaps can help ground us um, through ever-changing times. 
Um, and yes, we are excited that this is the 20th um, um, year of the BURST programming, but because we cannot sit still, we already are pleased to announce next year's book. And next year's book will be the 50th anniversary of Ernest J. Gaines' novel, The Autobiography of Miss Jane Pittman. Um, and along with that, I'll add that the BURST course that accompanies the selection, we have some of the students here tonight, um, will be held in the fall this upcoming year, um, a little different than it has been in the past, for those of you who might be interested, um, in that it will be an experiential um, learning project with students researching and developing a digital humanities project that will support the exhibition. But on to the Red Badge of Courage. Um, as Betsy mentioned, the Burst Committee, after discussing and debating so many wonderful and meaningful books, ultimately chose the Red Badge of Courage um, 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 and, and um, what well, I was going to say, as Betsy outlined, um, and is articulated in the statement from the committee, and that was celebrating its 125th anniversary. And I learned from Susan Tassin at, her, at the book group, uh, 20, 125 years of never being out of print. So it's been consistently in print for 125 <coughs> years. Um, Stephen Crane's classic novel is known for its early modernist portrayal of the Civil War and its psychological perspectives on the myth-making of heroism and cowardice. Still, in many respects, the Red Badge of Courage goes beyond history, suggesting relevance over a century later by speaking to issues of our day, specifically a country that is visibly divided along ideological lines, which for many may seem irreconcilable. In revisiting the Red Badge of Courage, one can't help but be prompted to ask, is our country broken? But is it a book of war? Or is it one of finding responsibility in the face of unease? Or a coming of age book? Well, to consider the book, its author, and its place in American culture and letters, we are honored to have Dr. Christopher Bemphy. He is the author of five highly regarded books about the American Gilded Age, including The Double Life of Stephen Crane and The Summer of Hummingbirds. His most recent book, If the Untold Story of Kipling's American Years, was a New York Times notable book of 2019. Um, Chris also is a cultural critic and public intellectual, if I may, um, a, a frequent con contributor to the New York Bu uh, Review of Books and the New York Times Sunday Times Book Review. Um, Chris is also a poet who um, uh, um, has um, regularly published work, works of poetry and engaged in, in the world of letters from that angle as well. Um, he's a Guggenheim and National Endowment for the Humanities Fellow, and as Betsy mentioned, is a Mellon Professor of English at Mount Holyoke College. So, with that said, please welcome Chris. Bemphy is the 20th speaker in the history of the BURST program. <laughs> Thank you, Betsy, and thank you, Adam, and thank you, Robert Blaze, who I just had the pleasure to talk with a little bit about Melville illustrations, a topic dear to both of our hearts. Um, and thank you, Christine, for showing me around the lovely um, exhibition out there. Um, color meant a great deal to Stephen Crane, and I, I'm very smitten with that red scheme design out there artifacts from the Civil War, the artifacts from Stephen Crane, and uh, the comic book version of the Red Badge of Courage. Um, as Adam mentioned, I did, I did write a book 100 years ago about Stephen Crane, um, which had a kind of a perverse um, argument to it. I called it The Double Life of Stephen Crane, and the argument was that Crane lived his life backwards, that he would first write an experience, and then he would try obsessively to experience it in real life. He first, with no experience of war, wrote a book about war, and then he became a really significant um, war correspondent. He first uh, wrote a hallucinatory story about a shipwreck, and then he managed to get himself into a shipwreck, and he <laughs> wrote the great story, The Open Boat. He uh, first wrote a book about a sex worker, and then he set up housekeeping with the madam of a house of prostitution <laughs> in Jacksonville. Um, 
It's always interesting to go back to a book you loved when you were a different person. Um, I was in my early 30s when I first became obsessed with Stephen Crane, and I'm in my, I was going to say my early 60s, but that's not quite true. I'm in my mid-60s now, and, um, and thanks to Adam and Betsy and Bob and the rest of you, um, I've been invited to go back into this book. And um, I teach at a women's college. This um, Red Badge of Courage is not an obvious book to teach at a women's college. There are remarkably uh, few women characters in the book. Um, <clears throat> and it often is thought of as a kind of a guy book, um, uh, like many of our American classics. Um, in going back through the book, though, I found something else was grabbing my attention, and that was the um, pervasive theme of poverty, both in Crane's life um, and, oddly, in The Red Badge of Courage. So my, my working title for this talk is um, Stephen Crane's War on Poverty. Um, so during the spring of 1893, Stephen Crane began writing a novel tentatively titled Private Fleming, His Various Battles, about an ordinary soldier's experiences during the American Civil War. The nature of courage was not front and center in Stephen Crane's mind at the time. Crane was more concerned with getting enough to eat a 21-year-old college dropout, Crane had been living a hand-to-mouth existence as a freelance writer for New York newspapers, mainly covering the sufferings of the urban poor and homeless, which he knew at first hand. The gap between haves and have-nots, already conspicuous during the Gilded Age, widened after the financial panic of 1893 when the population of homeless and unemployed people mushroomed in American cities, and especially in New York. Crane had completed a previous novel, begun during his brief stint at Syracuse University, about a jilted Irish girl's descent into poverty and prostitution called Maggie, a girl of the streets, which he had published with his own money from what was left of his inheritance from his mother. During the brutal, blizzard-ridden winter of 1894, as he pored over illustrated accounts of the Civil War and especially the Battle of Chancellorsville, Crane dressed up as a homeless man and spent a couple of nights in a lurid downtown homeless shelter, writing up his findings in a vivid, vivid sketch called An Experiment in Misery. Quote, he was going forth to eat as the wanderer may eat he wrote of his disguised protagonist, and sleep as the homeless sleep. Commenting on the story, Crane explained that he had, quote, tried to make plain that the root of Bowery life is a sort of cowardice. Perhaps he added, I mean a lack of ambition or to willingly be knocked flat and accept the licking. Scholars have noticed the apparent disjunction between Crane's immersive experience of urban poverty, his notion that only through hardship can you truly understand the poor, and his simultaneous investment, imaginative investment, in war, seemingly so remote from his own experience. Ironically, as Crane's recent biographer, biographer Paul Sarantino remarks, ironically, while Crane was exploring immersion as the basis for his art, he was continuing to imagine and write about a war that had ended more than six years before his birth. And yet, Crane's seemingly heartless social Darwinist remark about the root of Bowery life as being a sort of cowardice is an early indication that the apparently disparate subjects of war and urban poverty were united for Crane by the shared theme of cowardice. 
To put it slightly differently, Crane conceived of war and poverty as opportunities or tests of courage. In another sketch written about the same time, Crane compared the wanderings of a homeless tramp to, quote, detailed accounts of great battles. Not an obvious connection, but an interesting connection. During these months of privation, Crane was pursuing an extended experiment in misery of his own. While both of his parents were dead, his father a prominent Methodist minister in New Jersey, his mother a crusader for the Women's Christian Temperance Union, Crane's older brothers included a prosperous lawyer in Port Jervis and a teacher in nearby Patterson, New Jersey. We still wonder, one of Crane's nieces later remarked, we still wonder why he went through such experiences when he was always so very welcome at both our house and Uncle Edmund's. But Crane preferred the hard scrabble life on the margins in Manhattan. When a newspaper editor asked him in 1895 about the origins of the Red Badge of Courage, Crane said that the novel was, quote, an effort born of pain. <clears throat> it seems a pity that art should be a child of pain, he added. Of course, we have fine writers who are prosperous and contented. But in my opinion, their work would be greater if this were not so. It lacks the sting it would have if written under the spur of a great need. Crane had no secure address during this period of voluntary poverty, sporadically sharing a large studio with three artist friends. You can see some of the pictures of these studios in the show in the lobby of the library. Sporadically sharing a large studio with three artist friends in a boarding house, or really a flop house, in the decrepit old Art Students League building on East 23rd Street. In the topmost and remotest studio, Crane wrote, there is an old beam which bears this line from Emerson in half obliterated chalk marks. Quote, congratulate yourselves if you have done something strange and extravagant and broken the monotony of a decorous age. And yet, just to repeat, boldly pursuing what Emerson said was something strange and extravagant was emphatically not what Crane was trying to do in his Civil War novel. His primary objective in taking up such a hackneyed subject was to make money. Quote, I deliberately started to do a pot boiler, Crane confessed, something that would take the boarding school element. Crane, as I said before, was too young to have had any direct experience of war. But here, too, the boarding school element came to his rescue. Crane wrote, I never even smelled, I never even, I never smelled even the powder of a sham battle. But he said he had gotten, quote, his sense of the rage of conflict on the football field. So. Let that be a lesson. If you want to write a war novel, <laughs> play football. But Stephen Crane was an artist to his fingertips. Compromise does not come easily to such temperaments. As he worked feverishly at his money-making pot boiler, Crane felt the quickening of his artistic ambitions. I got interested in the thing in spite of myself, he reported to a friend. And I couldn't, I couldn't, I had to do it my own way. In other words, he couldn't write a pot boiler. <clears throat> and so it, wrote, so it was that Crane ended up writing something strange and extravagant after all, the incandescent novel we now know as The Red Badge of Courage, a masterpiece of continuous stylistic invention and visionary intensity. Is it possible, however, that the novel's conflicted origins as pulp fiction written for money versus a book that he made in his own way, is it possible that the, not, that the novel's conflicted origins remained in the finished work in some way? 
That d divided origin might help to explain the shockingly diverse interpretations that the novel has inspired during the century plus in which it has remained in print and steadily acquired the status of a classic work of American literature. We might, for the sake of convenience, sketch out three main ways, or really two plus, in which the novel has been understood during the 20th century. If we take the nature of courage as the central theme of the narrative, it will be seen that courage is treated in starkly different terms in each of these readings. First, the novel maintains its status, we might call this its boarding school status, as a book about an ancient, I'm sorry, a book about an anxious young man's passage from boyhood to manhood after surviving the testing ground of an intense battle. In his first encounter with fighting, so this version of the novel goes, the young man runs abjectly from the fray. Only when he has digested the traumatic experience does he return and demonstrates conspicuous bravery in leading a charge and capturing the enemy's flag. Courage, according to this narrative, is achieved by dint of facing up to danger <clears throat> and recognizing that bravery can win the day. In this version, The Red Badge of Courage is a coming-of-age novel, a novel about how war turns cowardly boys into courageous men. A second reading of the novel is a more complicated version of the first. In this interpretation, the passage from cowardice to courage is more ambiguous, less clearly drawn. We're forced to recognize that the youth in Crane's account appears to stumble accidentally into courage, rather than grasping it intentionally. After running from battle and persuading himself that it was the rational thing to do, he is shocked to learn that his regiment was victorious after all. Deeply ashamed, he envies the parade of wounded men longing for a wound, a red badge of courage of his own. When he tries to exact a description of the battle from a passing veteran, the veteran swings his rifle and hits the youth in the head. Thus the youth suffers a wound after all his own personal red badge of courage. And it is this wound inflicted by friendly fire, so to speak, that facilitates his triumphant return to his regiment and his even more triumphant performance in battle the next day. The supreme test is the battle itself. The youth passes the, passes the test with flying colors, sees in the actual colors the Confederate battle flag. Courage, according to the second version of the narrative, may be achieved in roundabout ways, but it is still the real thing. This is the fake it till you make it approach to courage. A third reading of the novel casts a colder eye on the youth's performance. This reading highlights the fact that the youth's courage is purchased by a lie. He tells his friend, the loud soldier, that he was shot in the head. Of course, he had suffered nothing of the kind. According to this reading, Crane sought in the Red Badge of Courage to question the very nature of battlefield courage and treated the pompous dreams of the youth with relentless irony. What the youth achieves on his second day of battle is not maturity or a quiet manhood, but rather a momentary stilling of self-doubt. Courage, according to this third version of the narrative, is an uneasy blend of shame and mania. Courage is a fraud, an illusion of youth, a swindle. I don't see how we can overemphasize just how extreme the disagreements over the meaning of the novel have been. And this debate about the meaning of the novel goes on to this day. It goes on in classrooms everywhere that the book is read. Imagine two people looking at Van Gogh's Starry Night. What a devastating image of oblivion, one person says. All I can think of is death. 
What an ecstatic vision of life on earth and in heaven, says another. All I can think of is the glory of existence. I was tempted to talk about Adam's crows over the wheat field, which is similarly diverse interpretations. <clears throat> As critics argued about the Red Badge of Courage over the years and debated Crane's intentions, a fresh piece of evidence was enlisted by the proponents of this third version. The third version, let me remind you, is that Crane viewed courage as a lie. This fresh piece of evidence was the original manuscript of the novel. It turned out on close inspection that certain editorial interventions had been inflicted on Crane's original text, with the result that his irony was apparently deliberately toned down. The originalists argued that Crane had written an out-and-out anti-war novel, a book that critiqued all the motivations for war, along with its supposed benefits, heroism, courage, maturity, manhood, and so on. <clears throat> so this battle between triumphalists and ironists, Red Badge of Courage is heroic coming of age novel, or Red Badge of Courage is deeply ironic uh, deflation of battlefield heroism. It turns out that this argument between triumphalists and ironists had played out already and in an unexpected place and without benefit of the original manuscript of the Red Badge of Courage. In 1950, the great film director John Huston won the reluctant support of the Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer studio to make a movie of Stephen Crane's classic novel. You can see the uh, original poster for the novel out in the exhibition in the lobby. As Lillian Ross writes in Picture, her marvelous book-length account of the making and unmaking of the movie, the MGM executives were convinced that the project would be a commercial disaster. In their view, the movie Houston had in mind, quote, had no standard plot, no romance, no leading female characters, and if Houston had his way, he would also have no stars. To which one could add, no African American characters, no mention of the Civil War or its causes, and so on. Houston had bold ideas for telling his war story. First, he insisted on using black and white film, hoping to match some of the high contrast and visual intensity of Matthew Brady's famous photographs of the war, photographs that happened to have been a major source for Stephen Crane as well. Second, Houston wanted Audie Murphy, the most decorated American soldier in World War II, but a Hollywood unknown, to play the starring role of the youth and not, as the studio heads proposed, a recognizable heartthrob like Montgomery Clift. Most importantly, though, was Houston's overall interpretation of Crane's novel. As Ross put it, Houston, like Stephen Crane, wanted to show something of the emotions of men in war and the ironically thin line between cowardice and heroism. From the start, Houston, John Houston, do we know something about John Houston, the treasure of the Sierra Madre, um, the African queen, uh, the creepy, creepy father in uh, Chinatown? That's, uh, that's John Houston. Um, Angelica Houston's dad. Um, from the start, Houston was determined to eliminate any hint of traditional heroism or tragic grandeur from his account of the youth's initiation under fire. He carefully explained to his star, Audie Murphy, that there was a humorous aspect to the youth's panic. Fear in a man is something tragic or reprehensible. You know, Audie, Houston said, but fear in a youth, it's ludicrous. To accentuate the youth's abject response to battle, Houston emphasized a second act of cowardice. The youth abandons the severely wounded and disoriented tattered soldier to his death. For Houston, this scene was the high point of the film. 
When Houston met with a composer who would provide a musical soundtrack for the film, he sought to reinforce this anti-heroic interpretation. The boy is afraid, Houston explained, and it is funny. Houston thought the youth's bravery was also funny by insisting on, quote, the irony of the youth's heroic action. Houston was crafting a critique of battlefield courage. He suggested that a banjo, rather than the traditional trumpets, might reduce any temptation to view the youth in a tragic way. So he's telling the composer, let's use a banjo for the soundtrack. That'd be perfect. He shouldn't be treated tragically, he told the composer. He is a little ridiculous. <laughs> you, you're getting the point. Ludicrous, ridiculous, funny. Even in the final scenes, when the youth leads a charge against the enemy and seizes the rebel battle flag, Houston saw nothing but irony. Far from showing the youth's final triumph in battle, Houston aimed to express instead, quote, the pointlessness of the youth's courage in helping to capture a fragment of wall, end of quote, an, an advantage immediately abandoned by the regiment. So they capture the wall, and then they leave the battlefield. In Houston's view, Crane's novel placed the whole notion of courage under a microscope and found it wanting. Houston's film failed with its initial previews, and Houston himself departed to Africa to film The African Queen. And various remedies were proposed by the studio. It was thought that the transition from cowardice to courage was too abrupt, with nothing to indicate why the youth suddenly stops being a coward and becomes a hero. The transition, it was, it was suggested, might be eased with voiceover narration drawn from the novel, so that was put into the movie. The scene of the tattered soldier's death, Houston's favorite, was cut from the film, since it reinforced the youth's cowardice. At the outset, the narrator gravely informed audiences that the Red Batch of Courage was an acknowledged literary classic. <laughs> All of these were trying to sell this failed movie. And with all the fixes, the revised film was still a failure with audiences. Houston's film was never the film the fixers wanted. They wanted tragedy, heroism, redemption. These were, these were precisely the things Houston sought to banish from the film. And there was so, only so much that they could do to remake or unmake the film that Houston had made. <coughs> In the first scene of the Red Badge of Courage that Houston shot, a column of new recruits encounters a corpse in the road. Houston gave careful attention to the appearance of the actor playing the dead man, dousing his hair and face with multiple layers of mud and fake blood, and repeatedly reminded the bit players that this was their first corpse and that their faces should respond accordingly. For Houston, the scenes in which the youth contemplated death, the corpse in the road, a dead officer sitting against a tree in the woods, the tattered soldier dying, were the heart of his film. Two of the scenes ended up on the cutting room floor. For Houston, the living contemplating the dead is the primal event of the film, towing the ironic line between cowardice and courage. For the distinguished art historian Michael Fried, encounters with corpses are also the crucial passages in the Red Badge of Courage. The scene that preoccupied Houston of new recruits encountering a dead body in the road happens to be the first literary passage examined in Fried's important book, Realism, Writing, Disfiguration, on Thomas Aikens and Stephen Crane. For Freed, the intensity of the scene arises from factors other than those adumbrated by Houston. For Freed, the scene exists, exhibits what he calls the conflicted nature of Crane's realism. Now here's the relevant passage from the Red Badge. Once the line encountered the body of a dead soldier, he lay upon his back staring at the sky. He was dressed in an awkward suit of yellowish brown the youth could see that the soles of his shoes had been worn to the thinness of writing paper. 
He vaguely desired to walk around and around the body and stare, the impulse of the living to try to read in dead eyes the answer to the question. In Freud's analysis, Crane, like the gawking recruits, could not take his eyes off the dead man's face, but for other reasons than those evoked by John Huston. Freed argues that Crane tried to write a realistic account of men and war while simultaneously and unconsciously writing about the physical act of writing and the actual tools of writing. Hence the references in Crane's text to lines and writing paper and the impulse to read in dead eyes. According to Freed, the image of the upturned face recurs in many of Crane's texts and always carries this double weight of the fraught scene of writing. <clears throat> I mentioned at the start of this talk the curious linkage for Crane between urban poverty and war as occasions for cowardice or courage. Faced with poverty, the poor can be brave or cowardly, Crane suggests, just like the young recruits. As it happens, Crane was hardly alone during the 1890s in addressing the boundary between cowardly and courageous behavior. A constellation of literary texts probed the distinction, as though a whole generation of writers, too young to have experienced war firsthand, considered the, nation of, the nature of courage to be a pressing problem. While the relative absence of major, with the relative absence of major wars, there was a worried sense that the blessings of peace not be all that they were cracked up to be. As Crane writes of his youthful recruit in the first chapter of the Red Badge, quote, there had been a portion of the world's history which he had regarded as the time of wars, but it, he thought, had been long gone over the horizon and had disappeared forever. Around 1900, there was a pervasive worry among the privileged classes in the United States that society afflicted with peace was becoming over-civilized, soft, cowardly. T.S. Eliot remarked that Boston was, quote, refined beyond the point of civilization. For whatever cultural or historical reasons, we find in the space of five or six years, first the Red Batch of Courage in 1895, in which a young man deserts his regiment, Rudyard Kipling's American novel Captain's Courageous of 1897, in which a spoiled rich kid is rescued by a fishing vessel headed to the North Atlantic, Joseph Conrad's Lord Jim of 1900, in which the first mate of a ship full of poor immigrants saves his own life while abandoning his vulnerable charges. What these works have in common is a preliminary diagnosis of manly cowardice, which must be healed, so to speak, by conspicuous acts of courage. In each case, the protagonist is dragged down into poverty, and in each case, the protagonist, found wanting when first tested by circumstance, is granted a second chance at bravery. <clears throat> the writers of these works were united by ties of friendship and admiration. Crane was deeply indebted to Kipling's works. The two men met in New York in 1896, and it was from Kipling that Crane had derived his deep-seated conviction that art and suffering were allied. There are few things more edifying unto art, says the artist hero of Kipling's The Light That Failed, than the actual belly pinch of hunger. Conrad and Crane, Conrad gets pride of place in the exhibition here, Conrad and Crane forged a close friendship in England. It has been suggested that not only did Crane borrow and Lord Jim a major theme from the Red Badge of Courage, that of a coward given a second chance, but that he might even have modeled Jim on Stephen Crane himself. Now I'm coming around to my, uh, my con conclusion, so hold your breath. <clears throat> Stephen Crane's two great subjects, 
as I've said multiple times, were urban poverty and war. These were the conditions he tried obsessively to experience in his own life. As a freelance newspaper man, he lived so close to starvation that he hardly had to pass as an indigent writer. Having vividly imagined war in the red badge, he spent the rest of his life chasing actual wars as a war correspondent for Pulitzer and Hearst. So what's the linkage of poverty and war? Is there some tight connection? William James thought so. In the lectures that became his 1902 masterpiece, The Varieties of Religious Experience, James conceived of the world as, quote, essentially a theater for heroism. War was the traditional machinery for turning young men into heroes, in James's view. He could almost be describing the plot of the Red Badge when he wrote, quote, the most significant individual, I'm sorry, the most insignificant individual when thrown into an army in the field, is weaned from whatever excess of tenderness towards his precious person he may bring with him and may easily develop into a monster of insensibility. The challenge, William James believed, <clears throat> was to find in a modern and more civilized world, a world in which wars, James thought, had been banished to the past, to find in this peaceful world, quote, something heroic that will speak to men as universally as war does. In a phrase that became famous after the publication of his 1910 essay, an essay that opens with a nostalgic embrace of the Civil War, William James announced the need in civilized times for what he called, quote, a moral equivalent of war. For men of earlier times, and James is only talking about men, for men of earlier times, according to James, the greatest fear was war, the specter that haunts Henry Fleming of being found wanting on the battlefield. What then were modern men in a world of commercial trade most afraid of? For Americans of the Gilded Age, the greatest fear in James's startling view was poverty. Quote, we have grown literally afraid to be poor, he wrote. Scared as men were never scared in history at material ugliness and hardship. When we quake at the thought of having a child without a bank account and doomed to manual labor, it is time for thinking men to protest against so unmanly and irreligious a state of opinion." End of quote. Forget Theodore, forget Theodore Roosevelt's martial fantasies of the strenuous life, his theatrical rough riders passing for heroic soldiers of the past. Forget all that. As James said, poverty is the strenuous life. Without brass bands, or uniforms, or hysteric popular applause, or lies, or circumlocutions. Poverty is the strenuous life. There's a moment in the Red Badge of Courage <clears throat> when the fear of battle and the fear of poverty converge dramatically. It comes from the same passage that so fascinated both John Huston, the filmmaker, and Michael Fried, the art historian when the marching column of raw recruits encounters their first corpse in the road. And I'll read it again with another sentence included. He was dressed in an awkward and yellowish brown. The youth could see that the soles of his feet had been worn to the thinness of writing paper. And from a great rent in one, the dead foot projected piteously. And it was as if fate had betrayed the soldier. In death, it exposed to his enemies that poverty which in life he had perhaps concealed from his friends. Strange sense. Every sense in the Red Badge of Courage is strange. 
And it was as if fate had betrayed the soldier. In death it exposed to his enemies that poverty which in life he had perhaps concealed from his friends. For a moment we are transported by that elegantly balanced sentence which recalls the phrasing of Samuel Johnson to a very different battlefield altogether. The youth is paralyzed by the fear that he will run from battle. And here is a dead soldier who was afraid instead that his carefully concealed poverty would be revealed. The two great sources of fear, war and poverty, are thus momentarily elided in the Red Badge of Courage, as they were for William James. In a society obsessed with martial prowess or making money, any falling short is regarded as shameful, hence to be hidden from the sight of others. And both war and poverty for Crane and for James provide an opening for courage. Exposure for both writers is a small price to pay for a more noble, a more courageous existence. James writes, we have lost the power even of imagining what the ancient idealization of poverty could have meant, the liberation from material attachments, the unbribed soul. If, as James believed, the prevalent fear of poverty has become our, quote, worst moral disease, then perhaps voluntary poverty could serve a money-grubbing age like Crane's, like our own, as, quote, the transformation of military courage. Thank you. So I'd be happy to field a few questions about war, football, or poverty. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Now I had questions that kept evolving because you kept taking us into different places. And so I'm going to come back to my initial question with the spin from the end, which is um, early in the book you mentioned Homer. And yes. And the Homeric. Yeah. Says that's all over. Right. That's right. So where does that fit in with? Is that a nostalgic or? Absolutely. Time yes. Is sort of sacred and safe from all of this. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. So, so early in the early in the novel, in the first chapter, um, as the youth is headed, it, as they're waiting, 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 waiting to see any real action. Um, the youth reflects that the days of Homeric battle are over, and um, I don't remember Crane's exact wording, but um, you know, basically that all we care about is trade and commerce. And war has been banished. Um, and of course, he's completely ambivalent because he's both enraptured at the idea that he'll be found to have the right metal and terrified that he won't. But yes. Um, and I'm suggesting that both Crane and William James are writing, writing from the perspective that maybe wars are coming to an end. That's the fear suggested in the Red Badge and um, the fear that William James has that we're all going to become softies. And, yeah. and there's a connection between Crane and William James. William James's well-known brother Henry was a good friend of Stephen Crane. Yeah. Is it <coughs> fear that the kind of war of the ancient world isn't here anymore? You and I don't fight up close and personal and look each other in the eye. I kill you from a hundred yards away, without because of the weaponry, yeah. the rifle in the yeah. Civil War, and even better weapons in subsequent wars, yep. cannons that can kill from hundreds and hundreds of yards. Does that make war and heroism antithetical? Yeah, that's a great question. There's a wonderful, well, there are two wonderful images out in the um, <laughs> exhibition from uh, Winslow Homer. Winslow Homer um, 
before doing nostalgic scenes of <laughs> New England was a great battlefield um, artist. Um, and there's one of the, the, the sniper, which, which suggests the incredible weaponry of the Civil War, and at the same time, the fact that soldiers had no armor. Um, they were wearing woolen <laughs> coats. Um, so that, I think that recognition that war had become impossible for heroism um, waits until World War I. It's true it already happened in the Civil War, but Stephen Crane still writes the battlefield scenes of the Red Badge of Courage as though it's almost hand-to-hand -hand contact. He wants, he wants Henry Fleming not to be holding a gun, but just to be holding the, the standard and then grabbing the enemy's standard and sort of running through bullets and, and so on. Um, so I think, you know, the, that nightmare of mechanized warfare, which had already been experienced in the Russo-Japanese War, which is going on um, in, in Crane's lifetime, um, I don't think that's, that's his fear about war. He thinks it's, it's disappearing, ironic, under the circumstances, since just after the novel was published, we had about 100 years of continuous war, and we're still having it. So I don't think it's entirely gone away. So, um, so William James' essay, The Moral Equivalent of War, was incredibly um, influential in American society. And um, the idea of some kind of national service as some kind of voluntary poverty, at least for a couple of years, like the couple of years, one might be expected to serve in the armed forces if one were drafted. That's um, had its life in the Peace Corps. It's called the Peace Corps with exactly that idea of we can get the experience of the Marine Corps <laughs> in times of peace in Teach for America and a lot of things that college students, I think, look at as, um, as something viable and and worth doing before a career in finance or consulting. <laughs> College teaching. <laughs> <clears throat> I think it's still very much with us. Uh, Pete Buttigieg, very interesting case of a military man making the case for peaceful national service. We still, we still live with these. I mean, Adam was talking about the weird connections between the first Gilded Age and the second one, which is what we're living through now for our sins. See, Bob's giving me a look. What's going on here? I, I, I'm <laughs> curious if you, uh, you mentioned uh, Pete Buttigieg. <coughs> Uh, I was what thinking, else are we thinking about? <laughs> well, well, I, I, you just <clears throat> caused a nuclear explosion in my head <laughs> in terms of his association with the military. <clears throat> he does have an association with the military. But if you think of all of the individuals that have run for president or have been uh, lionized, in terms of military, they were true military. I don't know if Buttigieg. No, he wasn't, and and he, but he talked about oh, he hold it, being he trained him. with the uh, AK for AK. What do we, what do we about. use? That, <laughs> that was that was his association that no right. else could talk about. Correct. Uh, I no, I think he drove a vehicle and no. did some. No, desperate. I think I think that was a great example. <laughs> I'm not criticizing. I think that was a great example. 
I, I, I think, uh, <clears throat> I'm think i from Indiana, so uh, as, as, <laughs> as is my friend uh, <laughs> Betsy, we Hoosers, you know, we're not going to totally dump these guys on you. <laughs> She's even from South Bend, for God's sake. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, then you were talking about war and football. South Bend is war and football. <laughs> yeah, I play basketball now. <laughs> from Indiana. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's curious. The, the movie was just on recently uh, on TCM, the Turner Classic Movie. Uh, and I mean, it's interesting that, you know, in Houston, you know, one of the, Houston also did Moby Dick. So, All right. Uh, I always found it interesting that the hero, of which he is a hero in the movie, was also the most decorated human being in World War II. Correct. It's kind of ironic yep. that he plays just the opposite. Yeah, that Houston is saying, it's ludicrous when somebody like you is brave. Well, it's well, you yeah. used the word, I think. You, I think you did use the word ludicrous. So no, he, yeah, Houston does. And I think the individual that was that, that uh, introduced the movie, I don't think it was Mankiewicz. I, I, I can't remember. I, that's part of my problem today, is not being able to remember uh, that you would use this individual, Audie Murphy, uh, as this individual. But or he was trying to become an actor, so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think you nailed it. Thanks. I want to hear from more students. What do you think? Did, did you all read this book? I think the book is so strange, you know? It's not, we try to turn it into the book that our teachers seem to have thought it was in high school. And then you read it and you think it's like this hallucinatory kind of crazy book. <laughs> yeah. So you've done some research on this, yeah. Kind of talking about like different, um, like different editions of the book having like different um, like interpretations, but you didn't touch on the comic book. Like what? what yeah, see, I'm not a comic? scholar of the comic book, I'm sorry. <laughs> but you are. So touch on it. What did you? Um, I just thought it was it was more geared towards. It seemed like they were trying to take the story and like uh, a generation of like adults wanted the story for their kids and they could yes. Like translated the story yes. for someone that their kids could. See, I think I think even without the comic book, yeah. the parents have translated the yeah. story into the into the story they want it to be, which is a coming of age yeah. story. It's what all all American books are supposed to be. They're supposed <laughs> to be coming of age stories, and then they write Moby Dick or <laughs> or the Red Batch of Courage. Yeah, I mean, I. As I said at the beginning of the talk, I think some of the, just enough of the pot boiler is still in it, mm -hmm. that the comic book writers and the high school, the college teachers and the, and the parents can still make this book seem something that it's, that it's not. And the irony in it is, is shifty, is squishy. It's not a stable, oh, I get it. Crane thinks this whole war thing is ridiculous or ludicrous. Um, it's it's shifty. The book is uh, is squirrely, weaselly. It's strange. Um, it plays a lot of different keys. Um, so that I mean, when I talk about those three different views of the novel, those are major critical views of this book. You know, the book is a story of a young man finding courage in 48 hours. <laughs> the story is about a kid who's fooling himself right up to the very end. Yep. And head out and yep. become a man. 
and mom has a certain presence in the novel. Very big presence. <clears throat> That's right. Yep. Yeah. Talks like a mother should to her son going off to war. And mend his socks. Yeah. Yeah. She says, "Don't do anything you'd be ashamed of." Right. Right. And Ronjay can come home, which is a pretty good mom. Yeah. Um, but so it comes home either way. And I can't get yeah, it does. <laughs> and I get. Yeah. And I and I get where that would fit in with the um, coming of age story, right? Because you have to grow up. You have to leave home. And you have to leave mom. You have to. Become a man, but where does it fit in with the poverty story? Yeah, good. Man, what a great question. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, Crane, he did write a whole novel about a woman's descent into poverty, and it's a novel that uses just as familiar. Like everybody knew this. Everybody knew she was going to die. Everybody knew she'd kill herself. Every the story was so, was so well known, um, but he seems to have kind of endorsed the idea that poverty kills women and poverty elevates men. He did write a second poverty novel, though, called George's Mother, which is all mom all the time. And Oddly, the working title of George's mother, which he wrote right after the Red Badge of Courage, and I, by right after I mean a couple of months, a couple of months, a couple of I mean he's writing at just this red hot speed. The original title of George's mother was A Woman Without Weapons. It's kind of interesting. So some sense that maybe, um, I mean, the, the absence of women in the novel was a disaster for the filmmakers. You should check out the, uh, the original poster of the movie. Um, there's one scene where a soldier tries to steal a pig from a house. And a young woman comes running out to say, that's our pig. And the, the, the studio head said, make that bigger. <laughs> So you see a picture of Audie Murphy with the only woman in the movie. Like there's love interest. Like mm, it's gonna be Gone with the Wind after. They wanted Gone with the Wind, of course, which was the big <laughs> success. Yeah, but they got the Red Badge of Courage. Thank you very much. Great time. <laughs>